Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamancy. Tonight, exclusive access inside a war zone. It's one thing to get permission to come to this area, but actually going over the border is really like a gauntlet. Our CBC News team takes you past the checkpoints where Russian-backed forces fight the Ukrainian military as tensions escalate between East and West. Invading Ukraine is going to be a painful, violent, and bloody business. Last-ditch diplomacy as the U.S. puts thousands of troops on alert. <laughs> Truckers on the move, protesting the cross-border vaccine mandate and as premiers wade into supply chain politics. This is an essential service. We do a reality check on empty grocery shelves. Plus, a next level telescope reaches its final destination. 1.6 million clicks from Earth. This is The National. Even as the West pushes for a diplomatic solution to escalating tensions between Russia and Ukraine, it is bracing and today further preparing for the possibility of war. Military moves are being made, worry is building, and for one group of people in the region, a familiar feeling. In a CBC News exclusive, we're entering a territory usually off limits to foreign media to get a first-hand look at where Ukrainian forces and pro-Russian militants have been fighting for years. It is a conflict zone. It's also home to many people whose stories we're telling tonight. We'll get there in a moment, but first to the conflict that many are trying to prevent tonight. The hope is diplomacy will work, but as Susan Ormiston shows us, Western nations are getting ready in case it doesn't. U.S. troops readying to go to Europe, 8,500 on heightened alert. To make sure uh, that we're ready uh, to bolster the NATO alliance. As President Biden sends a military missive to President Putin, and the U.K.'s but Prime Minister warns. Invading Ukraine from a, from a Russian perspective is going to be a painful, violent and bloody business. Biden briefed European leaders for an hour and a half looking for a cohesive front. I had a very, very, very good meeting, total unanimity with all the European leaders. Supporting a NATO buildup. It's happening already. Additional warships and fighter jets being positioned in member countries close to Ukraine. We are considering to further enhance our presence in the eastern part of the alliance. This could include the deployment of additional NATO battle groups. U.S. military assistance arriving in Kyiv over the weekend with more on the way. Diplomats' families from the U.S. and U.K. embassies are leaving Kyiv. Canada so far is not withdrawing staff. Safety of Canadian diplomats and their families is, of course, paramount. Uh, and we will continue uh, to be there for Ukraine. The Kremlin accuses the West of hysteria, elevating the risks. But Putin shows no sign of de-escalating, sending more military into Belarus. That country key to the crisis, says a former U.S. ambassador. Uh, I think from the Russian standpoint, certainly from the Kremlin standpoint, the worst of all possible worlds would be if Belarus and uh, Ukraine both went westward and left Russia behind. I think that's, to some extent, one of the motivators of why the Russians are creating this crisis now. And Susan, why the change here in, in the U.S. position? Well, clearly not convinced of a diplomatic success here or that the sanctions threatened would deter Putin at this stage. And thirdly, Ian, political concerns that Biden would look weak without some active military option here. And he was briefed on those options this weekend. If the U.S. troops go... They'll be mostly called up under a NATO-led mission and to neighboring countries, not inside Ukraine. Thanks, Susan. You're welcome. Let's head now to Moscow, where Breyer Stewart is. And Breyer, we heard the, the Russian government's reaction to what's happening. What kind of reaction is this getting from, from others? 
Well, the Kremlinian has described these latest moves as hysteria, and certainly that's something that the, the state-controlled broadcasters here are trying to further with their narrative. Uh, you had anchors today that were mocking the U.S. and the U.K. for withdrawing staff from their embassy. And what they've said is that the, the West have accused the West of being so obsessed with the idea of Russia invading Ukraine that they're doing it as a, as a distraction. They want to distract away from the other security demands that Russia has put forward. And distract from some of the domestic issues going on in the U.S. and the U.K. All right. And speaking of what's going on in the region, a little later tonight, you're going to take us past a checkpoint into Donetsk, where foreign media generally not allowed in, but you and your team were there. And, and what did you see? Well, that's right. Donetsk is one of the two uh, breakaway republics, self-declared republics, that the international community does not recognize. And it's there where Russian-backed separatists have been fighting against the Ukrainian army since 2014. It's an area that's very difficult for foreign journalists to get access into. And we went there uh, because we wanted to talk to people who've been living uh, in a conflict zone for the past eight years and get their thoughts on just uh, the uncertainty that lies ahead. And here's a, a short excerpt from our report tonight. Is your dream to one day be able to live in the house again? As he leads us into the yard, he points to more damage from a rocket that was fired nearby in 2015. In the back, he shows us how we had to crouch behind a metal sheet during another attack. Now that's just one of the people that we spoke to in Donetsk and we'll have many more of their stories tonight. And that's in about 15 minutes. Thanks, Brian. You're welcome. Cybersecurity continues to be a concern as tensions rise. Ottawa confirming today there was a cyber attack last Wednesday against Global Affairs Canada. It left some diplomats without access to some online services. The same week, federal cybersecurity agencies put out a warning about Russia-backed threats. Ottawa not naming any suspects, or at least not yet. There is a protest movement hitting Canadian roads. A group of truckers opposing the cross-border vaccination mandate is headed to Ottawa, picking up support from some premiers along the way who blame some empty store shelves and groceries on the mandate. But as Alison Northcott explains, there's more to this story. On a Winnipeg street, a convoy of trucks and other vehicles protest vaccine mandates. Because it affects jobs, it affects everyone's truckers, farmers, you name it. Other convoys are headed all the way to Ottawa to protest new rules requiring cross-border truckers to be vaccinated. The Canadian Trucking Alliance says the vast majority of Canadian truckers are vaccinated and says it disapproves of protests on public roadways. Some premiers are waiting in. Is it just going to essentially have a, a negative uh, result in us not being able to access uh, the, the, the goods and services uh, that truckers bring to our community each and every day? Alberta Premier Jason Kenney tweeted photos of empty grocery store shelves, blaming the mandate and calling for the policy to end. But the Canadian Federation of Independent Grocers says the trucking mandate is just one of several factors that might lead some Canadians to not finding all they want at the grocery store, along with labour shortages and extreme weather. Now, it doesn't mean the shelves are completely barren or anything like that, but we're already starting to see for some products where we're, they're just not coming in time or we're not getting them in the quantities uh, that, that we need. Come a couple of times and there haven't been garbage bags and spices. The spices are really low. Yeah, you, you feel it. So now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm having to pick and choose. This Edmonton store is struggling with workers off sick and unpredictable deliveries. So if we are typically waiting three days on an order, let's give it six days now. The trucker mandate is extra pressure on a strained system, but there is still plenty of food available, says this expert. I don't think we're going to be running out of food at grocery stores. We may see some outages of certain products. He says consumers shouldn't panic or panic buy. That will only make things worse. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. In Quebec, vaccine mandates aren't just affecting what's in big box stores, but who can enter them. Today, the province instituting its new vaccine passport rule for those outlets. 
Here's Justin Hayward. Nobody gets past these doors without proof of vaccination and a photo ID. Customers say they knew it was coming. I think it's a good idea. It's just a question to be to get used to it. A pharmacy and a grocery store are the only exceptions to the new rule requiring proof of vaccination at big box stores. Some customers at this construction supply store say they're going along with the new measure for now, but patients could wear thin. The annoyance will make people either go get it or, you know, get more anti-vax. And it's the people working the front line, asking for proof of vaccination, who take the brunt of the backlash. To live in Mac, you're... Enforcing these rules is far and away what has caused the most aggression against us, says this hardware store chain executive. When the provincial government barred the unvaccinated from government liquor stores and marijuana shops, the number of people signing up for their first dose quadrupled. This infectious disease expert says measures like this can help, as long as they don't drag on too long. Some people are scared, some people are reluctant for other reasons, so sometimes they need a little push to, to get their vaccines. Close to 90% of Quebec's eligible population has gotten at least one dose. The Legault government is now opting for the carrot instead of the stick, announcing what it calls a positive approach to reach the holdouts, including vaccination pop-ups and a telephone hotline. Justin Hayward, CBC News, Montreal. One of the goals of these mandates is to take the pressure off Canada's overburdened hospital system. It is struggling to keep up, even as the number of infections appear to be dropping. And after the alarming peak that began around the holidays, hospitalization rates nationally have slowed, even showing some signs of plateauing. But that doesn't tell the whole story in some provinces. Alberta, for example, bracing for a new onslaught. It's facing a record high number of COVID patients. As Julia Wong explains, the province is setting up field hospitals today. Orientation for staff at a field hospital in Edmonton began Monday as the province prepares for more COVID-19 patients. The first could be in these extra beds as early as Thursday. The hospital situation is dire. We've never really seen a recovery from the fourth wave. As many as 60 beds could be set up over the next two weeks inside field hospitals in Edmonton and Calgary. They're meant for recovering COVID-19 patients and patients with less complex health needs. But new beds does not mean new staff. When we start to change our care practices, open up new beds without adequate staffing, what we're looking at is still, um, you know, a hospital that's sinking. New infections may have peaked in the province, but hospitalizations are still rising. Previous waves saw strain on ICUs, but this wave is poised to stress the entire system. Emergency departments are also extremely busy. Increase in transfers between hospitals due to COVID-19. Staffing challenges across the health system and beyond. 5% of staff across all of Alberta Health Services, or about 5,500 workers, are sick at any given moment. On top of that, they're exhausted. There's this moral injury of knowing that we may not be able to provide the care as it was before because we are so stretched, but that doesn't sit well with us. This nurse usually works on the cancer ward. She voluntarily deployed to the ICU during the Delta wave. She's still there and stealing herself. It, it's going to be tense. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's a, a bit of a dark time right now in healthcare. There's a, a sustained amount of pressure on healthcare workers. Albertans have been told to get ready for some difficult weeks ahead. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. The senior military officer who once led Canada's vaccine rollout, Major General Danny Fortin, has pleaded not guilty to a charge of sexual assault. This alleged incident dating back to 1988 when he was a student at Royal Military College. Fortin opted to have his case tried by a judge rather than a jury. A Florida man charged with smuggling migrants across the Canada-U.S. border will be released from custody with restrictions. 47-year-old Steve Shand faces one charge of transporting or attempting to transport undocumented migrants after four people, including an infant, were found dead near Emerson, Manitoba last week. There's heavy fighting in Syria tonight and word that hundreds of boys are being used as human shields after Islamic State forces attacked a prison on Friday to free their members. U.S.-backed Kurdish forces are now trying to reclaim it. Chaos spread quickly after Islamic State fighters descended on the prison complex. It's all happening in northeastern Syria in the city of Al-Hasakah. 
Margaret Evans tells us why. What's long been feared coming to pass on the streets of El Hasaka. Here, Kurdish-led soldiers hunting ISIS militants after they attacked a prison on Friday in a bid to free thousands of their comrades. They set off two car bombs near its entrance, allowing some inmates to escape and others to take up arms inside the prison. Fighter jets from the U.S.-led coalition backing the Kurds have been skimming the skyline, and U.S. special forces are reportedly in action on the ground. But this spokesman for the Kurds says the fight was scaled down over the weekend because of worries over civilian casualties. An estimated 6,000 families have been displaced by the fighting. And rights groups fear hundreds of boys and teenagers in the prison, relatives of ISIS militants, are now being held as human shields. It is of utmost importance that uh, the local forces and the U.S.-led coalition do their utmost to protect these children from harm as they try to retake the prison. The Syrian Kurds have long warned ISIS sleeper cells are growing stronger, that the security situation in prisons and camps has become untenable. They've begged Western nations, including Canada, to repatriate their nationals, especially women and children who are held in the camps without a horizon. It's imperative that these countries get their nationals out of there, uh, because if not, the blood of, of their nationals will also be on their hands, not just on the hands of ISIS. Analysts say with the world watching Russian intentions towards Ukraine, it was the perfect time for ISIS to stage its attack. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. The uncertainty over Ukraine and a possible Russian invasion seemed to make investors extra nervous. In the United States, the Dow lost a staggering 1,100 points before rebounding late in the day to post a gain. The economic situation in the U.S. seemed to strike a nerve today at a White House event as a reporter shouted a question about inflation at President Biden, who apparently thought his microphone was off. That's a great asset. More inflation. What a stupid son of a bitch. The reporter says Biden called him this evening and, quote, cleared the air. Inflation has hit a 40-year high in the United States, and Democrats fear they could pay a high price when voters have their say in November. As the world watches Russia and Ukraine, tonight we're taking you inside a region near the border, a place journalists rarely get access to. It's one thing to get permission to come to this area, but actually going over the border is really like a gauntlet. Next, an exclusive glimpse of what life is like under the near constant threat of war. Plus, the push to teach black history in all Canadian classrooms. How does it feel to not be part of the history books? It's not right. And a fireball above BC caught on camera. I saw a really bright flash and a huge um, tail streaking across the sky. We're back in two. Welcome back. We're about to take you into a part of the world that foreign journalists are not usually allowed to enter. It sits near the Russia-Ukraine border, two countries the world is watching closely as tensions rise between them. This region is called Donetsk. Fighting between the Ukrainian military and Russian-backed separatists began there eight years ago. Parts are now self-declared republics controlled by pro-Russian groups. But Breyer Stewart and a CBC News crew were recently granted exclusive access beyond the control line. And here's what they found. It's a rare look at the outskirts of Donetsk, where some blocks appear frozen in time. Scarred from a deadly eight-year war that threatens to erupt again. If you're going through Ukraine, the only way into this place is through a series of checkpoints and roadblocks. You need permission from the Ukrainian military, as well as from Russian-backed separatists, who frequently deny the scrutinizing glare of the foreign media. But CBC was recently given access 
to go over the control line that divides the Donbass. We're finally driving into Donetsk after spending about eight hours at the border crossing. It's one thing to get permission to come to this area, but actually going over the border is really like a gauntlet. During our time in Donetsk, we were accompanied by an escort, including in villages near the front line, like Oktoberskaya. This community saw some of the heaviest fighting, and in a nearly deserted street, we met Mikhail Kravchuk, who was on his way to feed some chickens. His house is on this block, but he and his wife don't live here anymore. He says they stayed as long as they could before they were forced to run for their lives during the intense fighting back in 2014. Is your dream to one day be able to live in the house again? As he leads us into the yard, he points to more damage from a rocket that was fired nearby in 2015. In the back, he shows us how we had to crouch behind a metal sheet during another attack. Scattered around are shell casings because even amid a war, he's a practical man and he uses them to collect water for his garden, one of the ways he's trying to rebuild his fragile life. Inside his home, pictures of his sons. The oldest died while trying to flee during shelling. Most of the destruction in Donetsk happened during the early days of the war. The airport was an epicenter of one of the battles between Russian-backed separatists and the Ukrainian military. It still lies in ruin. More than 14,000 people have been killed on both sides of the 420 kilometer dividing line. Next, we traveled 30 kilometers southeast of Donetsk to the community of Alexandrivka and met the Azorin family, where three generations live together in a meager house in a mining town. All of the adults here say they've nearly died after being caught up in shelling. For Vida, it was in November when she was on her way to work. Then a month later, her husband, 52-year-old Pyotr, was hit by shrapnel. He had surgery but was told 20 pieces are still embedded in him. But some scars aren't as visible. Five-year-old Yaroslav doesn't speak much. His family believes he's traumatized by the war going on around him. The war and border have divided families in the region and left Donetsk more isolated. The self-proclaimed republic isn't recognized by Canada or most of the world. 900,000 live in this city where an 11 p.m. curfew was in place most of the week but lifted on the weekend. On a Saturday night, young people take advantage of the extra hours at a bar downtown. While most wanted to enjoy their evening and not wade into the contentious topics of politics and war, a few told us they don't like living here and would leave if they could. She told us she wants to move to Moscow soon. 
And nearly every day of the week, buses full of locals return from Russia, where residents have picked up newly minted Russian passports. Here, the connection and influence are obvious and everywhere. The Republic's flag flies beside Russia's. Signs around the city boast of a Russian Donbass. Абсолютно большинство наших граждан хочет быть как можно ближе к России. The leader of the Donetsk People's Republic, Denis Pushilin, told us he wished the region went the same way as Crimea. By that he means voting to join Russia, even though most of the international community saw that referendum as illegitimate. We also asked what kind of help Russia is now giving to Donetsk. We are forced to protect our borders, but it would be extremely difficult to do if he insisted there are no Russian troops on the ground here. As for the troop buildup near Ukraine's border, he dismissed fears of a large-scale invasion. Most here aren't panicked by the prospect either, because they've been resigned to the conflict around them. Before we leave Donetsk, we visit the apartment Mikhail Kravchuk and his wife Natalia are renting. The smell of fresh cake wafts through the air in their cozy kitchen. But beneath the smiles, the pain is still raw. After being married for more than 50 years, they just want to be able to move back to their home. И будем перебираться, если, конечно, не будет эскалации, которую грозятся сотворить. А так мы всей душой там. For now, he's left holding on to the memories of his family's life on the street before they lived in the shadow of war. So, Briar, as we pointed out, this is a place the journalists usually don't have access to. What was it like to be there? Well, it was interesting, Ian, because we had permission to go, but even when we were on our way there, we weren't quite sure what to expect because we had this escort uh, from the security services that was assigned to us. So we weren't sure whether he would be intervening or interrupting in our, or questioning, but that really didn't happen. We had some restrictions put on us because we couldn't move into certain areas where there was active fighting going on. Uh, but we were allowed to speak to people on the street and in the, in the bars, as you saw there. And it was really quite something to hear people talk talk about being resigned to living in the middle of a conflict zone and not too worried about, you know, a troop buildup or a potential invasion because war has just become a part of their life. And the other thing that I want to mention uh, around that border, which I didn't get time to, to put in the story, is that the border restrictions make it very difficult for people to come in and out of Donetsk. Um, not only do they need permission from the, the military and the security services, but COVID has also played a role too. That, that border crossing that we were at in 2019, there were 7 million crossings a year. Well, now with COVID, it's dropped dramatically, just 28,000 a year. And so you have people that are already traumatized, I mean, living with, in, in a conflict zone, in a war, that face the added isolation of being separated from their families. Yeah, the impact of this pandemic everywhere. Thanks, Breyer. You're welcome. A milestone is being celebrated tonight at NASA. Its new super powerful telescope has reached its final destination. I've been describing this as the 14 days of terror, but really it's been 14 days of joy. Coming up, what's next for a mission more than a million kilometers away? Plus. Can you guys tell me anything about what a black person has done? What will it take to ensure black history is taught in every Canadian classroom? But first, an interview you'll see here Wednesday night. Longtime CBC journalist Anna Maria Tremonti, the former host of The Current, sits down with Adrian to share a long held secret the trauma of her abusive marriage. Here's a preview. And he said, Either you leave or I leave or I'm gonna kill you. It's just a matter of time. My God. What do you do in that moment? Uh, I was, I didn't know if I believed him. Hmm. I didn't know if he was capable of it. Because you didn't want to believe him or? I was so far down a rabbit hole.
As we reported last night, the federal government has announced another child care agreement, this time with Nunavut. Today, the prime minister described these deals as a game changer for families. The savings on child care for families in Iqaluit is estimated at around $14,000 a year. Ontario remains the holdout. The province says it wants more funding and a longer commitment than five years. As we head into Black History Month, we're expanding on a special series we first brought you last spring. Black on the Prairies explored the past, present and future for black Canadians living there. But there's still many stories to tell and we begin with the effort to teach more black history in schools, while many educators would like to see it made mandatory. Omara Issa tells us about a Saskatchewan teacher who's decided to do just that. Can you guys tell me anything about what a black person has done? Christian Mbanza is on a mission. Mifflin Gibbs, he was the first politician that was black in Canada. And we never ever talk about him. To teach his students about black history on the prairies and across Canada. Because I'm passionate about black history, I get to teach that in my classroom, and I know that that's not the same for every, every school. Saskatchewan teachers can choose to teach black history, but like in many provinces, are not mandated to do so. It's a privilege because other schools don't have the opportunity. Some young kids use um, the N-word for some reason because they don't know like the history behind it. And I feel like if we can educate young kids, then maybe they'll stop saying it. That's my aunt, aunt great aunt Ina at the school that she taught in Maidstone. Carol Lafed Boyd's family has been in Saskatchewan for more than 100 years. Advocates like her say that black people have a long history on the prairies and their absence from prairie history books is painful. How does it feel to be here for more than a century and not be part of the history books? It's not right, that's one thing. And uh, that's why I um, am part of the, the struggle to see that it, that changes. CBC News has confirmed all Prairie provinces are reviewing their curricula. But Saskatchewan and Manitoba are not mandating teaching black history at this point. Meanwhile, Alberta has delayed implementation of new curriculum after a draft version was criticized for best language and flaws in how it covers race, colonialism and indigenous people. And a lot of the people that started or accomplished a lot of hi history in Canada, but they never get recognized for. For now, Christian Mbanza says he's proud to keep teaching it and his students are all in. Omer Isa, CBC News, Regina. There are so many stories waiting to be told about the black experience in the Canadian West, and there's an interactive site you can explore. Just head to CBC's Black on the Prairies Place edition at cbc.ca backslash place. After another alleged racist incident on the ice this weekend, we want to have a conversation about racism in hockey with two former professional players. You're either not paying attention to what's happening around you, or you just don't care. Their messages for the now suspended player and what they say should happen next. Once again, hockey is grappling with racism and tonight we're going to talk to two former players about what should happen next. The most recent incident was Saturday night. During a game in the East Coast Hockey League, Jordan Subban faced what's alleged to have been a racial gesture by Jacob Panetta. That player has been suspended indefinitely. And last week, an American Hockey League player was suspended for 30 games for making a racial gesture to Boko Imama. Well, let's bring in two former professional hockey players who've given a lot of thought to issues like this. Bernie Saunders played pro hockey in the late 70s and 80s in the NHL and, and the AHL as well. He's the author of Shut Out, The Game That Did Not Love Me Black. And Anson Carter played for more than 10 years in the NHL, and he's the co-chair of the NHL Player Inclusion Committee. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Anson, what was your reaction when you heard about, especially this latest incident in the ECHL? I was shocked, like everyone else that I've talked to. And we have a group chat with our Player Inclusion Committee, and our group chat was on fire because we had just spent the last week celebrating Willie O'Ree raising his jersey to the rafters, celebrating Dr. K. 
King here in the United States. And this is happening after the previous week in the AHL, Boko went through the same exact thing. So I was shocked. I was shell shocked that I was, first of all, impressed by the way the AHL handled that suspension. They came down hard, 30 game suspension with the ability to claw back some games, 21 games. They went through diversity inclusion training with myself and my player inclusion committee members. But I was shocked the fact that this East Coast Hockey League player lacked that awareness to understand that this gesture was not okay. And Bernie, what about your reaction? Uh, I wasn't shocked because I've seen it my entire life. Um, as you mentioned, I, I wrote a book on the subject and I talk about the monkey gesture on, on page one of my book. And so my reaction is more disappointing because I'm 65 years old and it's just so disappointing that in 2022, hockey is still facing situations like this. Bernie disappointed that hockey is still facing this, but on the other hand, you know, it's getting a lot of attention now. When, when, when you had to endure this sort of stuff in the 70s and 80s, I take it there wasn't a lot of attention. Yeah, there, there's that side of it too, because it is encouraging. Um, I, 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 again, face this multiple times per game, almost every road game when I played um, in, in the early 80s, late, late 70s. And now with a, with a situation like this, you have two uh, incidents that happen in the minor league level and to become national news. And so for me, that's encouraging that the, um, the spotlight is being shone on, upon this. Anson, if you could talk to Jacob Panetta, the player that allegedly made these racial gestures, he made some sort of gesture towards Jordan Subban. If, if you could talk to him, what would you say? I would say it's imperative that you, you know, work with our group and have a conversation about diversity and inclusion and have some training take place. Because I've read some statements, I've seen videos online where he said that he didn't mean to do this. Whether that's true or not, we're not here to debate that. But if he had diversity and inclusion training prior to this event happening, I can promise you he wouldn't have made that mistake. And that's what was so frustrating for me. And that's why I was so shocked, because this was big time news just last week, less than a week ago in the AHL. So you're either not paying attention to what's happening around you or you just don't care. But if I had a chance to talk to him, that's exactly what I would do. I'd say, let's have a conversation with my committee first, and then let's walk through this training and inclusion and education that we went through with the NHL officials in September. A lot of those white officials were blown away by the kind of training. They said, you know what, Anson? We didn't know a lot of these things. We had no idea. And that's part of it, because this is systematic. It isn't just a one-off. It isn't just in the United States. It's just not in Canada. It's systematic within the game of hockey. And Bernie, what would you say to Panetta if you had the chance to talk to, to him? Well, it's, it's interesting because my first reaction as a black man is, is that I, I think the young, young man deserves due process. You know, people jump, jump to judgment and, and I, I saw the video that, that he put out. And so I think he deserves due process. And it's interesting because as a black man, understand that we didn't get a lot of due process. I mean, you, you asked George Floyd about due process and, and it's, it's, it's almost a joke. But you can't be hy hypocritical. So I, I think that uh, that he, he deserves you know, kind of a, a trial type type of a thing. But 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 um, like Anson said, 2022, man, you, you got to be smarter than that. You just can't be doing things like that in 2022. We have maybe 20 seconds left. Anson, last word to you. I would say we have to take this opportunity now to educate people. You know, this happened back in Bernie's day. It happened in my day. It'll continue to happen unless we have these conversations about educating people and training people. And let's not be fooled. There's going to be people that'll be in front of the cameras now that'll be talking about this and taking advantage of the moment. Don't be fooled by these people. Let's make sure we're actually putting in the work. There's a lot of solutions that are being put in place right now that it won't happen overnight. It's going to take years for this to happen and to try to correct our game. But people are actually working at doing this. Let's not just get blindfolded and have people distract us from the fact that real work is actually being put in within the game. And let's not lose sight of the fact that both of you were fantastic hockey players. You deserve kudos for that. But uh, thank you very much for, for speaking tonight uh, about this difficult topic. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Ian. Another note from the sports world tonight. We are just days away from the start of the Olympics.
get ready for the sights and sounds of the world's best athletes going for gold. CBC is the official broadcaster of the Olympic Winter Games. We'll be bringing you all the drama from Beijing, from the ski hill to the skating rink, plus the challenges of hosting a global event during a pandemic. It all begins next week with the opening ceremony on February 4th, hosted by Adrian and Andrew and Scott Russell from CBC Sports. The most powerful space telescope ever built has finally arrived at its destination tonight. Next, how a journey more than a million kilometers away is only the beginning. A rare sight in Greece, the Acropolis blanketed in snow as a storm swept across the country, actually all the way to Turkey. It's trapped motorists and forced schools and roads to close. Flights were cancelled and beaches turned white, though it wasn't enough to stop these two swimmers. NASA scientists say that volcanic eruption near Tonga earlier this month was hundreds of times more powerful than the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. The blast so large it obliterated the volcanic island and spawned tsunamis that killed three people in Tonga and across the Pacific in Peru. The world's largest and most powerful space telescope has reached its final destination. I'm going to show you an animation of what NASA's James Webb Telescope looks like, located in space about 1.6 million kilometers away from Earth. As Jayla Bernstein explains, it's going to show us the universe like we've never seen it before. On Christmas Day, these scientists watch their life's work launch into space. The James Webb Space Telescope was finally off, but there was still a perilous journey ahead. I've been describing this as the 14 days of terror. But really, it's been 14 days of joy uh, because the, the whole process went uh, flawlessly. After launch, there were exactly 344 things that could have gone wrong. One failure and the entire mission would have been disrupted, but it worked. It'll take about six months of calibrating and testing before scientific data can finally start flowing back to Earth. I'm ecstatic. This is such an amazing opportunity. This Edmonton astronomer's research will use the telescope's ability to see infrared light. Until now, clouds of stellar soot blocked astronomers from getting a good look at the Triangulum Galaxy. We'll see clearer and more detailed pictures, but we'll also get this new view that was inaccessible to Hubble by basically seeing through this material. It's like looking through a fog for the first time. We don't know what this Quebec astronomer will be using her time with the telescope to determine whether planets in the TRAPPIST-1 solar system have an atmosphere. If they do have an atmosphere, then that means there may, there may be a chance to, to look for traces of life on, in those atmospheres. We know on Earth we need an atmosphere to, to live, basically. Okay. So While right she says it's all very exciting, there's a lot of pressure, like, too. It is, like, very stressful, I have to, I have, I have to admit. No one has ever worked with a telescope like this before. The James Webb will literally look back in time more than 13.5 billion years, all the way back to the first galaxies that formed. We only have very limited information on this part of the universe because previous telescopes just haven't been able to see there. This cosmic eye is bound to see things that will alter our very understanding of the universe. There's going to be a huge number of surprises that come back from this telescope. It really is set up to kind of open discovery space and find things that we weren't expecting to find. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. As the James Webb Telescope zoomed out to space, a little bit of space landed here. The story behind this caught-on-camera moment, next. Some British Columbians with their eyes on the sky recently got a treat. The bright flash of a meteor streaking through the sky. And lucky for us, it was captured on a doorbell camera. To find out more about it, we called up an expert. A little science lesson is our moment. I saw a really bright flash and a huge um, tail streaking across the sky. And the sky was literally lit up because of that meteor because it was, it was so bright. The first thing came into my mind, okay, this was a bolide, which is also a meteor, but much bigger than a meteor. 
And we have, you know, millions and millions of meteors just in, in, in the space. Meteors are nothing but just debris in space. And they orbit our sun, just like planets, asteroids, and comets. Those objects are entering our Earth's atmosphere at 70 kilometers per second. And when they explode, they make a loud, loud sound. And when these bolides enter our Earth's atmosphere, they explode. And then, you know, when they explode, you can see a bright flash of light. You see meteors, if, if we get clear skies, clear nights, you know, and if we go out of town where there is no light pollution, millions and millions of meteors and and i've been looking up at the night sky like a billion times and i've never seen one how cool would that be to see although probably a little scary as well also i don't have a doorbell or a doorbell camera so maybe doomed just to watch the moment over and over again that is the national for january 24th good night <laughs>